And what I'm here today to talk to you about is HTML5. So hopefully I came up on the screen okay, good. So HTML5 is a whole bunch of new web standards um, which are going to make the web a much more interesting and interactive and fun place, especially for web developers. Um, it's not a new set of standards, or sorry, it's not a new version in the way you might be familiar with, with software, for example, moving from version 4 to version 5. It's a whole bunch of different features. Some browsers implement lots of them, other browsers have poorer support. So it's kind of, you know, if you were actually building an application that makes use of some of these features, you have to actually check the browser support before you do anything. But just like everything else, it's got some good sides and bad sides, so that's what I'm going to talk a bit about today. So it's three topics, three parts of this or of this uh, talk. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about the good side. You know what? I'm just going to zoom that out a bit. So the good side of HTML5, and there's a lot of really cool, good features in there that make you know, web sites a lot more interactive. Just like any other ability, of course, these can also be used for bad. So quick show of hands, who here has ever watched like a superhero movie? Right? Okay, X-Men, that sort of thing. So some kid gets the power of invisibility. He could spend the rest of his life, you know, you know, infiltrating terrorist cells or doing something useful. But before he does that, he goes straight to the girls' changing rooms, right? So exact same ability, but can be used in a good way and a bad way. So we'll talk about the bad side of HTML5. And then the third topic I'm going to talk about, well, we'll come to that a little bit later on. We'll come to that at the end. So there's a lot of good features in HTML5, and I'm going to feature just five which I think are the coolest and are going to make a, the biggest influence. So we'll show some examples. The first is something called Canvas. So there's two new graphics libraries in HTML5. Uh, Canvas deals with all the 2D stuff, and WebGL does all the 3D stuff. So the idea here is that they want to make it a lot easier to develop animations and drawings, and the sort of stuff that you would have historically used Flash for. You can now just do in HTML. So with some simple code like this, which is not horribly complicated code, uh, you write a bit of HTML and JavaScript like that, and you end up with a red rectangle and a blue ball in front of it, okay? Not terribly exciting, but hope you appreciate it's pretty simple to do this, right? The code is not exactly hard. So, of course, there's cooler things you can do using the Canvas library than this. Um, one of the things people use the web a lot for is uploading pictures, interacting with them, you know, giving your pictures to friends, doing all sorts of modifications to them, and so on. So here's another Canvas example. Um, this time we have three different images. We just have the, the new B-Sides logo. I can do stuff like I can drag it around. I can kind of resize it. I can, you know, make it look like a Polaroid, for example. There's the old B-Sides logo. You know, identify the corners. A whole bunch of, you know, you can, this is just using the Canvas libraries. You can interact with stuff a lot more. Now, I, I'm a, freely admit I am a terrible web developer. So if I can come up with stuff like this, you know, people who actually know what they're doing can do a much, much better job than I can. Um, so that's, that, to me, is better than a bunch of blue balls or red rectangles on the screen. Um, pun intended on the blue balls. But um, For the WebGL, then, so that's the 3D side, what three engineers in Google did an excellent job of showing this off. So in their 20% project time, they came up with a project where they wanted to see what they could do with the new 3D graphics libraries. So who here has played Doom or Quake? Right? Everybody, right? So Quake 2 in particular was, I used to play it extensively in college. It was the first time I ever actually upgraded a machine just to play a game, because my old machine was crap. Um, and what they did was they ported the entire Quake 2 engine into HTML5. So everything's written in JavaScript and so on. So I have a demo of that here. One sec, we'll just go on to the next slide. So you can see the demo here running. This is just a YouTube video of it run running. So for anybody who's familiar with Quake 2, that's exactly what Quake 2 looks like. Bear in mind, this is all done in HTML and JavaScript. As it says, it says in the screen, they actually pointed out, this is a browser, right? This is all running in the browser. The graphics you're seeing there, uh, the, tr the 3D graphics are done with the WebGL library, and then all the kind of walls and stuff, that's all the canvas, the, the thing I just used for the, the images a while ago. Um, it's also got all the original audio from the game um, using HTML5 audio. If you don't believe me, you get the idea, right? Everybody knows what Quake 2 sounds like. All the networking here is done with WebSockets, which is essentially real-time networking communication. So forget about all that AJAX-style polling. This is proper sockets all implemented in JavaScript. Um, it's a pretty good frame rate, as you can see. All of the actual saved games are saved locally in the browser. And you can see that regardless of whether you actually are a fan of a game like Quake, which it seems like most of the room are, this type of graphics libraries really does change how people can use the internet. 
It, it, even you could see consoles that are running, essentially, you're the thin client console, and all the hard work is done in the server somewhere. And then just like in real life, some sneaky git comes up and shoots you at the end. So that's the first feature of HTML5 I think is going to make a big difference, these two new um, graphics libraries. The second feature, I've already kind of sneaked it in, which is video. So a lot of what we do on the internet involves either audio or video. Like YouTube is probably one of the most popular sites outside of Google or Facebook. And up until now, if anybody's ever put a video in a website before, you've either uploaded something to YouTube and then just linked it in, or if you've gone down the flash route, you have all those horrible object tags and embed, and it just doesn't seem very nice. I mean, considering the amount of time we spend putting videos and stuff online, it should be a lot easier. So now with HTML5, it is a lot easier. There's simply a video tag. You just put the source in of whatever video you want, and that's pretty much it. The, the browser will take care of everything else for you. That's way, way nicer than all the flash stuff. So you can start seeing why Adobe are very, very interested in how HTML5 does, because kind of it does away with the need for Flash. Also, because it's much better supported, you can interact with the videos more with JavaScript, because it's all part of the DOM. So let's take the same video we had earlier on from Quake. So I've got a button outside of the video, but I can cause it to play because it's just using, you know, it's just calling that object in the page. I can do nice funky stuff like, you know, add CSS effects and properly interact with videos as if they were, you know, a real part of the, the web page. So that's two features. A third feature is a lot of the time nowadays when you go online, you're not using, you're certainly not using really a desktop to go online anymore. In fact, a lot of time you're not even using a laptop. You're using something like um, an iPad or an iPhone, some sort of mobile device. Um, so that opens up a whole new area that you can interact with people in the whole area of geolocation. And geolocation is literally about three lines of JavaScript in HTML5 to find somebody's GPS coordinates. So to give a quick demo, um, if I just click and go show position, let's see how accurate this gets. So that's not too bad. All right, so I'm within about 91 meters of where that red dot is, which looks pretty accurate. Now this is based on my IP address because I'm just connecting through the Wi-Fi here. If I do this from my phone, it's going to use the GPS of the phone, so it's going to be even more accurate. And you can also track people. So you can, you can get their location one time, or you can ask for updates every second or two seconds so that you can track them moving around the real world. That opens up a lot of you know, interesting uses, like uh, advertisers can use this to give you really targeted advertising. Like when you're walking down the road, the McDonald's down the road gives you an ad for the nearby McDonald's. Um, there's also some funky games people have built with this. Uh, I've seen one demo of somebody who's implemented Pac-Man in the real world using HTML5's geolocation. So you walk around the streets with your iPad, and you, you know, one person's Pac-Man, the other guys are ghosts. And they, as they're walking around on the actual map, things get updated. Um, I haven't heard of any fatalities yet from people crossing a road with an iPad like this. But you know, these things can happen. Uh, you might have noticed as well that actually a lot of these demos, like this, I'm not using PowerPoint here, for example, or Keynote. All of the actual slideshow here is just all written in HTML5. So the whole slideshow is actually just JavaScript and CSS, um, which makes it really easy to embed all these demos into it. So that's three features. Fourth cool feature, and I am going to get onto the bad stuff later on, but this is the, the cool new stuff, is something called drag and drop. So drag and drop is very, very simple. The idea is you can drag content from the web onto your computer, or you can drag content from your computer onto the web. So it doesn't seem that revolutionary, but what it actually does is it really blurs the line between where the web application stops and where your actual system starts, uh, which is pretty cool. So to give an example, um, I'll just minimize my window slightly. So like in the past, if you wanted to download uh, this PDF or this MP3, Normally, you'd you know, right-click, save as, save to desktop, or click on it, and the little file download icon thing comes up. To me, both of those are a bit, you know, they're not great. Uh, they could be better. So just to show, if you just use drag and drop, I can simply grab the PDF, drop it onto the desktop, just downloads it. This should work, hopefully. I should probably check. It's about a four and a half meg PDF. So it takes a second to download. But eh, there we go. So it's, that's a lot more user friendly to me. You just grab stuff from the website, you toss them onto your desktop, and you have them. Uh, likewise, you can go the opposite direction, so you can upload stuff. So I just have, here's a bunch of the Twitter icons from the people presenting at B sides. So just grab them, drop them into the website, and now I can do, you know, fully interact with them and play around with them and so on, right? So, and if you think about what that means for a site like uh, Facebook or a social network, 
You come back from your holidays, you have all your pictures and your camera, camera phone, you put them onto the computer, you just literally drop them into the browser window and now you can start sharing them with people or do whatever the hell you want. That's a lot nicer than some sort of upload tool or a whole load of different file boxes that you have to click. So that's covered four of the features, four of the cool stuff. We talked about the uh, new graphics libraries, geolocation, drag and drop, and how easy it is to put video and audio in. There's one other feature I wanted to talk about, which is something called web notifications. And these are little pop-ups that look like this one, right? So don't forget to tell them about web notifications. They exist outside of the browser, so if I minimize my browser, you can see it's still there. Um, what these do is they allow a web application to essentially create, these are perfect for something like webmail or an instant message client or any social network that gives you kind of a, an update when something happens. Um, and this is a nice way to segue into the kind of bad side of HTML5, because you can also use them for evil purposes. So imagine you were, anybody here from, actually nobody wants to admit they're from Microsoft, so I won't ask people to put up their hands. But imagine Microsoft were doing an online, um, you know, it's like Google, or their, their version of Microsoft Online Office, well they could bring back this little guy, right? So you can use this for very evil purposes, or you can use it for very useful purposes, depending on what you want to do with the actual uh, web notifications. So on the bad side, there's a lot of these features can be used for criminal purposes or for you know, hacking purposes. And a lot of the bad features are best kind of illustrated by actually looking at some code examples and so on. So I've, I've written a paper on this. I'll send a link. There's a link at the end if anybody wants to read it. But those bad examples are better done by looking at the code. So, but that doesn't really look very go, go well with a presentation. So what I'm going to do in the presentation instead is put together a whole attack scenario using some of these different attacks that you can do, not all of them, um, to give you a feel for what you can do with HTML5. So we start off with, in our scenario, we've got a hacker. I'm going to use the anonymous mask because, you know, why not? So let's imagine this hacker is trying to break into some company we're going to call Bravo Limited. Okay. So the first thing he does um, is he starts doing some reconnaissance on the network. He checks you know, all the various different sites like Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on to try and build up profiles on each of the employees. Um, obviously, he does scans in the network and so on, but he finds that the network's actually pretty locked down. So he's going after the weakest link, which is normally the actual humans who work in this imaginary company that I invented. Um, from doing that and from seeing some forum posts and so on, he figures out that the actual company he's targeting use a lot of different operating systems. So they use, there's a lot of guys using Mac, some Windows, some Linux. A lot of people, especially execs, use iPads almost exclusively to actually access the network. So he decides on using JavaScript as the one language that should work on every single one of those machines. Also, as part of his research, he finds out that 10 of the employees are big fans of vintage cars. They restore them the whole time, right? And they go to a vintage car forum every single day from work that they post to. So while the, the sites of the actual company are pretty locked in secure, this vintage car site has a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So he knows 10 people are going to go to that from the company, so he decides that's the beachhead. That's how he's going to start and get in. So he verifies this cross-site scripting the way that you always verify cross-site scripting with an alert box, right? Um, of course, that means that he can run any JavaScript that he feels like. Now, even if this site had taken steps to actually stop cross-site scripting, um, so I'm sure you guys are all familiar, a lot of sites will have blacklists uh, for things like script and image and those sort of tags that are associated with cross-site scripting. That's a really bad way to stop cross-site scripting. There's much better ways, but a lot of sites implement those sort of checks. And the problem is, is if you haven't updated your site with new blacklists, there's new tags and new attributes in HTML5 that can also be used for cross-site scripting attacks. So if you're still relying on your old filters from half a year ago, they're not going to work anymore. So to give an example of some of them, so uh, some of them are, as I said, are based on new tags. So the video tag, for example, has an on error um, in the source that you can use to execute JavaScript. So if you were just blocking scripts and image or whatever other ones, this new tag comes along, the browsers will still render it, and cross-site scripting is going to work. Then on the attribute side, there's some nice stuff you can do. With, uh, there's a new fe feature called autofocus, which just brings focus to you know, whatever uh, input element you have on the page. So this simple little one is just a piece of JavaScript that says, when focus is placed on this input, then run some, get some code, and then use autofocus to focus on it. So again, another cross-site scripting attack, but your old filters mightn't work for it. And this, is, this one's quite nice, actually. I like this one a lot. 
So this is using on scroll and then a whole bunch of breaks and then you have an input field down the very bottom of the page that you give focus to, which causes the page to scroll and kicks off the JavaScript. So uh, these are all, these and a whole bunch of other ones are up on html5sec.org, um, which is Mario Heydrich's site. So he's really good resource on all things cross-site scripting, not just HTML5 ones, but all the ones beforehand as well. So really good cheat sheet up there. So this, so the attacker has used cross-site scripting. He's managed to now run JavaScript on each of these 10 employees, remember, who visited this vintage car site. Of course, he wants to do more than a simple alert. He wants to actually take complete control of the machines as best as he possibly can. So being lazy, he decides to use an off-the-shelf toolkit. Uh, there's a very nice one uh, called Shell of the Future, which comes from some researchers in India called Attack and Defense Labs. Uh, the site is andlabs, A-N-D, labs.org, I think. And this is an entirely Java-based, uh, sorry, JavaScript-based toolkit that you can inject with a cross-site scripting vulnerability um, into a site. And what it allows the attacker to do is to connect to any of those infected users and browse the web session as if you were that user. So any sites that the victim can go to, you can go to too, um, in the context of the user. So if the user, you know, if the user automatically is logged into their webmail account with a cookie, then the attacker can go to their webmail account and see all that sort of stuff. So uses this off-the-shelf uh, tool um, and puts that up onto the vintage uh, car forum. Now these 10 people get owned by that particular tool, and the attacker can now issue one command, and all 10 people will actually carry it out for him. Okay, Very nice, very elegant. So the next thing he wants to do, obviously, is get a full detailed map of the network that he's just compromised, um, know as much about the network layout and so on as possible. And Using actually two new features of HTML5 um, for networking communication, he can carry out a full port scan of the network just from JavaScript. So one of these is everyone here is familiar with XML HTTP request, right? Simply just JavaScript lets you create a HTTP connection to another site. Um, up until now, in version one of this particular API, it's been subject to the same origin policy. So site A can send a request to site A, but site A cannot send a request to site B. Not allowed, right, because of security concerns. But there's a lot of reasons why developers will sometimes want to actually get content from another site. So maybe it's your personal blog, but you want to pull down your last couple of social network updates, or whatever the case may be. So in, in the new standard, HTML5 and all the new browsers uh, support this, they changed it so that site A can make a request to site B, but only read the content back if site B specifically allows it. And the way you do that as site B is you return back a header uh, called access uh, control allow origin, which basically says the following sites are allowed request content from me and I'll serve it back up to them. So now site A can request site B, it's in the list of allowed sites and site A gets the content back and can do whatever the hell it wants with it, right? Now that opens up a bunch of new different attacks. And the first one is, you might have seen sites before that look something like this, where you have an index page, and every time you click a link, essentially what the index page is doing is fetching some other PHP page from the server and embedding it maybe in the main part of the page. So you're all, it looks like you're always kind of staying on the same page, but it's actually using XML HTTP requests in the background to make these requests, right? Now, in the past, those type of sites were vulnerable to a kind of local file inclusion attack. So if you were a bad guy, you just change the, the PHP page here that is requesting to something like you know, the password file or try to get something local off the system. There will be the, they, it will make the request, grab that file, and hopefully display it to the attacker. But now, because this API allows it to access another site, the attacker can set up their own evil web server, um, change it to something like this, and now the, the vulnerable site will request a C99 shell, in this case, just any PHP shell from the attacker site. The attacker site re replies back with the uh, access control, you know, yes, anybody is allowed to grab my you know, PHP shell, and that'll get up, that will get run in the context of the original site. So it's vulnerable to an attack. Also, what you can do with these XML HTTP requests um, and WebSockets also, is that you can connect to any site or essentially any machine on any port. Well, almost any port. Some of them are filtered. Um, and because of that, and based on the timings involved, you can actually do a port scan. Um, this is implemented in, uh, actually, Javier is over there. Javier implemented this in the Beef project. So if anybody's familiar with Beef. Um, woo, 
Go Team Beef. Beef's awesome, by the way. Normally I show demo of beef in my talk, I just don't have enough time right now, so apologies. Um, but another thing that's very interesting about XML HTTP requests is that only reading of the response is limited. So site A can now always send a request to site B. It just can't read the response. And there's a lot of bad things you can do with JavaScript just by requesting a site where you don't care about the response. So you, know, you request, let's say, some gambling site, and you request to place a load of money on some horse. And if the person that, who's, you know, whose machine that you're running that JavaScript on is automatically authenticated with that site, that's going to work. You're not going to be able to read the response back, but you don't care as an attacker. You can also use that perfect for something like a denial of service attack, and I'll show a demo of that later on. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with a very subtle change to one API, opens up a whole bunch of new different attacks. So going back to our attacker, our attacker now is trying to scan the network. So he's got these 10 original infected machines. He performs a port scan of everything on the same range, whatever it is, 192.168 or 10.0. whatever, um, and can start seeing all of the open ports on the various machines that are out there. This is definitely a lot slower and less reliable than running Nmap, but it's all running entirely in the browser. So it's a lot stealthier um, and harder to see, because this is all just web traffic going around the network. As part of his scan, he figures out that there's a bunch of different web servers there, and you know, there's a, some FTP servers, and he figures this sort of thing out. And he notices that, just like most companies, including my own, the Trend Micro that I work for, there's some sort of internal home page, like, like myhome. In our case, trendmicro.com or like myhome.bravo.com, which is the default home page that every single person has once they open up, you know, Internet Explorer in the morning. And while the security team, which often happens, have done a very good job of securing all the external sites, a lot of these internal file servers and stuff are really outdated, running old, you know, not patched in years and so on. So what he can do is he orders one of his initial 10 machines to exploit a vulnerability, let's say a SQL vulnerability or so on, on that web server, um, and then upload the same attack script that he had on the car form. And now when every single person comes in the next morning and turns on, opens up Internet Explorer, or whatever, you know, they go to their default homepage, and then they all end up running his JavaScript. So now he is using this shell of this future script that I talked about from Andlabs, and he can control any machine in the company. <coughs> And this gets around one of the, the kind of big issues with these browser-based uh, botnets, which is it, they're really easy to clean up. So all the, to, to make this go away, all the company has to do is tell everybody in the company, please close your browsers. And the thing just goes poof. Right? It's not like a normal botnet that has rootkits and is really hooked into the system. Even closing the browser tab is enough to actually you know, stop the JavaScript running and the problem goes away. So, it's useful for attackers when they're setting up these type of botnets to make sure they have multiple places to reinfect you from, places that you're going to go to every single day and run the JavaScript all over again. They also need to do some stuff like uh, tab nabbing or some click jacking and so on to try and keep you on that tab as long as possible or keep that tab running somewhere in the background for the whole day. Um, a good way of doing that is some, even something as simple as social engineering, have a game that's kind of running in the background the whole day that's actually interesting for people to play so that they keep the game open all day and just go back to it every you know, hour or so. And then that's perfect for the attacker because their JavaScript code is running all day long. Um, but having said that, even though there is downsides to using kind of these browser-based botnets, um, there's a lot of upsides as well. They're very, very stealthy. Um, if, you, if you code up one of these, and I've, I've built a demo and actually got one of these fully working. Um, because they're running over HTTP, they'll go straight through most firewalls because it's just JavaScript. Um, because it's also JavaScript, you can obfuscate the hell out of it and make it a nightmare for any intrusion detection systems to detect. And it's also going to get, and I work for an antivirus company, by the way, antivirus companies are going to have a major headache with this because this barely touches the disk. It's nearly entirely memory resident. And antivirus companies don't like that. They prefer when things touch the disk. Um, so if it's not touching the disk, it makes it a lot harder to actually scan and stop this. Not impossible, but definitely a lot harder. So our attacker's taken over the whole network. Great. Um, he wants to do, before he starts extracting data off the, off the network, there's a couple of other cool things he can do. So he can use the same geolocation that we showed earlier on to not only know what all the servers are and, and all the machines and what ports are open, but where they're actually physically located in the world. And from that, you can start doing really interesting stuff. So the attacker can know that the CEO of the company is down the road at Starbucks getting a coffee, but his laptop's still in the office. 
because his iPhone, which is infected, is saying, hey, I'm down at Starbucks, but his laptop, which is still in the office, is reporting that that's where it is. So you can actually track the users with their mobile app, or especially like iPad users and so on. You can track them in real time as they walk around. Um, and I did some tests of this with uh, my, I don't have a much of a budget for like, you know, doing big surveys and stuff, so I always test nasty stuff like this in my family, and uh, it worked. So uh, it was very interesting to follow my sister not going to college for a day um, on her iPad. So the last thing your attacker wants to do, obviously, is extract as much data as you can from the network and then disappear. So extracting data, you can do that in a lot of ways. As I mentioned, he's running in the browser of each of these, these victims. So he has the option to you know, surf to anything they could surf. So the obvious choices there are things like the, the internal web mail, any internal kind of uh, web-based file servers and so on. So he should be able to browse them, start downloading, dumping all the de email databases and so on. But that's, that's traditional stuff. You can do that before HTML5 came along. So HTML5 adds in a couple of nice new things you can do. Uh, one is, you know the autocomplete feature? So when you go to a form and you start typing, it gives you whatever you entered before. There's a few nice tricks you can do with JavaScript now to actually get the content of those. Uh, a lot easier than you could in the past. You could do it at various stages in the past and it got fixed by various browsers, but now with HTML5 there's some nice new tricks to do this. So an attacker can simply create a whole bunch of hidden form fields that you won't see, they're in the background, for like, with, na with IDs like you know, name, email, credit card, even password, whatever, and start iterating, going, put, it, put an A into the box with JavaScript, then get all the results for A, get a B, and so on, and start actually mining through whatever you've entered in the past, which could be interesting stuff. Also, you remember the web notification, those little pop-ups I showed before? The content of them is just HTML. So you can make it look like just about anything. So for example, you can make it look like this, saying you've been logged out of Gmail, please enter your password in to, you know, to log back in. Now it always does show the actual real site that this is coming from. So you can see here in the corner, JS bin. It's just one of those sites that lets you run JavaScript to test things out. But you won't really notice that. You're going to see the Gmail logo and so on. And of course, you can make this look like anything. You, make it, you can make it look like a Microsoft Active Directory. You know, you've been logged out of whatever. Please log it in. Um, again, I tried this using my you know, pet guinea pigs, otherwise known as my family. Um, and they were nice enough to do things like upload files and send them to me. So I said, like, you know, could you please send a file from your machine to do blah, and Microsoft need it, and they sent it to me. Um, which either says something about the smartness of my sister or that you know, people will fall for this. But essentially, with HTML5, or sorry, with HTML and just whatever social engineering you can come up with, you can get people to do a lot of stuff with these pop-ups because they appear outside of the browser window. So people assume they're part of the operating system and not anything to do with the actual site. And another nice thing you can do to steal some information, it's a bit trickier to pull off, is actually record people's voices. So you can literally try to record what is going on in the room, just using JavaScript. Um, it will always, by the standards, have something like this. A kind of, you have to tell the person you are recording them at the time. That's, that's in all the browsers will do this. Um, I haven't yet figured out a way to actually kind of like put something over this, you know, using uh, CSS or something to display an image so you can't see it. But I'm sure you can come up with a plausible reason for, so, you know, a social engineering reason why you might have something like this on a screen. And if you do that, then you can actually literally listen to what the person is saying. What happens in the case of Chrome is anything they say gets sent to Google servers. Google then actually do the nice job of taking what they said and turning it into text for you. And then you can use JavaScript to grab that text and send it off to yourself. So nice little tack. Um, but you get the idea of kind of what you can do with this. You should be able to put another frame over it. I haven't managed to get it to work yet. It's because this isn't this isn't accessible at all from the DOM meter. This seems to be like the browser itself. So and it nearly always is, you know, at top of everything you put there. But I'm not saying you can't get something in front of it. I, as I said, I am a pretty crappy web programmer, so I am sure people smarter than me uh, can do this. Um, so that's some of the bad details with HTML5. Uh, and I want to talk about one other thing, which is the really, really ugly side. And to be honest, I've kind of cheated because I've, I've actually talked about this before. Um, for me, the most scary feature of all of HTML5 is the fact that it, for the first time, lets you realistically create something I call BitB, because everything needs an acronym these days, right? APT and so on. And BitB stands for botnets in the browser. So up until now, you've been able to do this in a limited way, but with stuff like uh, web sockets and web workers and all of these new features, you really genuinely can build um, proper botnets running entirely in the browser. 
And those botnets, as I said, they're very stealthy. They barely touch the disk. They can easily get around intrusion detection systems and so on. But it also means that an attacker, for probably the first time in a long time, can write one piece of code that should run on any device in any location anywhere on the planet. So it doesn't matter if you're running Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, you have an Android tablet, you have an iPad, it should work on absolutely everything, exact same piece of code. So I, as part of the paper that I wrote, I came up with a demo for this. Um, so I'll actually show you a part of the demo now. Um, in this case, I just had the client and server running on both on my own laptop, but in the actual lab I had you know, multiple machines being controlled from one classic command and control uh, system. You could also use a peer-to-peer -peer based command and control system, uh, which I'm working on at the moment, but this just gives you an idea of some of the stuff you can do with this. So obviously you can do stuff like, you know, finding out information about the host, so I can get the geolocation information and so on. That's important for any botnet. Um, you have the social engineering stuff that we showed before. Uh, so let me see here. So just that little pop-up that I talked about. So in this case, it's just the, the Gmail one. You know, I programmed that in. You can change this to anything that you want to. Uh, so close that. Because it's a, a zombie, I have to give it the ability to eat brains, which is very important. So now imagine what happens when 10,000 people whose like iPhones and stuff you've hacked suddenly all get that simultaneously. Um, that that to me is in, that that on its own is a good enough reason to do a proof of concept botnet. Um, so we also have, uh, let me see here, we have spam. So I'm just going to go to, to give you an example of how I can send spam from a botnet, which is you know, pretty important because people like doing that. So we just open up Gmail and also DDoS. So just to show DDoS working. So here I have just a virtual machine just running. You can see the, the amount of packets that are going to my virtual machine. This is just host only, so it's just on the network. And now I'm going to use web workers to DOS it. So I start the DOS, and you should see, so the packets jump up to about 250 on average I normally get from one infected machine. So again, multiply that by 10,000 people all running your JavaScript, and you have a proper DDoS attack. Um, I also benchmarked this against the JS like tool from, um, uh, from Anonymous, and my tool works slightly faster than theirs, um, because the web workers, web workers are essentially like background threads so you can run a JavaScript background thread that is just generating these requests over and over again. So it's perfect for something like DDoS. Um, also, because people will be going up and you know, online and offline the whole time because as they close tabs, a DDoS botnet is a pretty good business model for this because you don't care if the person's online the whole time just as long as they come back every couple of hours a day and generate some DDoS traffic for you. And then for the actual spam itself, so I, just, I have a test account set up here. I'm just going to uh, mark them as red so you can see. So the way I've got spam to work, luckily they, they haven't been stupid enough in this standard to actually um, you know, give you in JavaScript the ability to send email directly, because that would be a really, really bad idea. Um, but you, you guys are all familiar with like contact us pages. So what I did here was I simply found some old contact us pages where they had the email as a hidden field, changed that to whatever email address I want to send spam to, and used those as essentially open uh, mail relays so that I can send spam. So we just start sending some spam. So give this a couple of seconds. I don't want to send too much because I don't want to annoy Google. So I'm going to click stop spam. And hopefully now when I go to my Gmail account, we should have some new messages. So inbox, and you can see. So I just put a unique number at the end of each one based on the timestamp so it shows up more visually. But so you can send spam. You can do denial of service attacks. You can social engineer. You can do all that sort of stuff, all from just browser-based botnet. So, I think that this stuff is going to be used more and more. Um, at the moment, not many. I haven't really come across any criminal gangs particularly using this technique. I think it's perfect for something like a pen test as well. And uh, normally, this would be where I'd actually show off the beef tool as well, because beef is awesome for, for this sort of uh, stuff. Unfortunately, I don't have the time. So just to finish up, I'd like to say, if you're interested at all in any of this stuff, or you want to read the paper where I go into much more details, uh, HTML5security.org. Not my site, but it's a guy who's collected just about anything out there on HTML5 security, it's all up there. And I do occasionally tweet about this stuff, so anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, Twitter, I might occasionally actually mention some stuff about this. But personally, I think that the actual good, like the reason I get involved in security in the first place is I th think the web is just really, really interesting and fascinating. I think that the good stuff from HTML5 far outweighs the actual bad stuff. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what web developers do with this to change how we use the web today. That's it, folks. Thanks very much.